Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to another brand new episode of The Boss Babes. I am so excited to be here with you all today, as I always am. I am rocking a red turtleneck today, and it is for very good reason. We have former Boston Red Sox sideline reporter with us, Jenny Dell, waiting to speak with all of us. I cannot wait to have her on. I know that the Boston fans have been waiting for an amazing episode like this, so, st so stay tuned with us. First and foremost, we have Signature Popcorn. They are handcrafted gourmet popcorn for all occasions. Signature Popcorn has many flavors to choose from to satisfy both a sweet and salty craving. The popcorn is made with coconut oil, so of course it's healthy, and high quality ingredients like cane sugar and pink Himalayan salts. Visit SignaturePopcorn.com to order today. Again, guys, Signature Popcorn, like an autograph, .com. And we have the website posted right there below. So again, my boyfriend and I, we love the popcorn. They have lots of great flavors. A lot of holiday flavors are out right now. One of our favorites is strawberry cheesecake and cinnamon roll. So please, again, visit SignaturePopcorn.com. They absolutely rock. And without further ado, we are going to jump in with my girl, Jenny Dell. Jenny, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so excited to be here. And I think I need to get some Signature Popcorn. <laughs> You just topped it up. I want some. It is actually, I can send you a bag. It is so good. We have a birthday cake flavor that I think you guys would love. So literally I will send you a bag ASAP when we get back from a, we're flying to North Carolina tomorrow for a wedding, but when we're back, I'm sending you a bag I of it. I love this. I love this. I'm going to go check out the website too. Amazing. But well, thank you so much for joining us here today. I see you have a little man cave behind you. You have the middle of Brooks rock in the Jersey in the back of us. Before we get into baseball, before we get into sports media, you grew up right in New England. So you must be a diehard New Englander at heart. You grew up right in Southbury, Connecticut. So let's just chat it up about the fact that you grew up in New England. You are from Connecticut. What was it like growing up with your family in that state? It was, I mean, I think when you think of Connecticut, you think of like small town, you know, like white picket fence type of childhood and it actually was similar to that. I'm still best friends with all of my uh, neighbors that I grew up with. And it's interesting because you you mentioned New England and obviously I work for the Red Sox, but my parents are from Brooklyn, New York. They met in Brooklyn, they grew up there, they went to Brooklyn College. So growing up, I watched a lot of New York sports. So that was always uh, an interesting situation once I got the job in Boston. But I had a really good, like happy little childhood. I really, I think Connecticut is a beautiful state. I think some people don't have a lot of positive things to say about it because I mean, we don't have, you know, the professional sports teams that a lot of other states have, but we have UConn women's basketball. So I watched a lot of uh, college hoops growing up. <laughs> Super amazing. Yes, you are correct that you guys do not have those professional sports teams, but if you think about it, I feel like the New England Patriots, the Red Sox, the Celtics, we kind of, those sports take care of all of the neighboring states because Maine obviously doesn't have a professional team, right. Connecticut. So I, I still find it very interesting, though, that you grew up sort of like a Boston fan and also a New York fan because you mentioned that your parents grew up in Brooklyn. Was sort of was there like a rivalry going on there? Like when you so, started working in Boston, were they like, Jenny, you can't work in Boston because we love New York sports? The first problem was when I went to UMass and uh, my freshman year was 2004. So it was obviously Red Sox Yankees uh, going on. And I remember I lived with a bunch of girls that lived in Massachusetts. So when I, when we first started watching the series, I was, you know, I was like, yeah, Yankees. And I very quickly learned that being at UMass, you better switch that affiliation real quick or there's going to be an issue. So I think it was that year that I went to Fenway for the first time and I fell in love with Fenway Park. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with the Red Sox. Like I'm gonna go Sox. And um, when I actually got the job with Boston, my dad has a group of his boys from Brooklyn that they all moved to Connecticut together. And they, every Thursday night, they go to this like local Mexican restaurant and sit and you know watch a game and drink a beer and whatnot. And they're all Brooklyn boys. So when I got the job with the Sox, my dad walked in and it had, I don't think it was public yet, but my obviously my family knew, and he walked in with a Red Sox hat on. And all of his boys were like, what are you doing, Jeff? Are you insane? Like, what are you wearing? And he was like, listen, I'm gonna start cheering for the Red Sox. Jenny got a job with the Sox. She's gonna be the new sideline reporter for Nesson. And they were like, 
no, absolutely not. You can't switch affiliate. What are you doing? And it wasn't until that year I got him and all of his boys down on the field at Yankee Stadium during a Red Sox Yankees series when we were in New York. And they're like, okay, I guess we're okay with you working for Boston. Like as long as as long as we get these New York perks, we're good. So um, you know, I think that there's a special place in my family's heart now for the Red Sox. Obviously, that's where I met my husband and I had two great years working for Ness in there. So uh, it was it was a special time, but there was definitely a little like, wait a second, what are you doing? <laughs> I think that is such a cute story. I love how you dove deep into the fact that your parents and your family friends sound like they obviously are diehard New York fans. But the yeah. second you got that job, you were like, OK, if we're going to stay friends with the Dell family, we <laughs> probably should be rooting on both the Red Sox and the Yankees. So there we go. I I think that is super cute that they were able to sort of make the switch or root on both of those teams. Yeah. You mentioned that your family likes to go to some local Mexican restaurants mm -hmm. in the Connecticut area. What were some of your favorite restaurants that you enjoyed eating at as a child? And were there any favorite dishes that you and your family like to make during the holiday season? Ooh, I love talking food. So you are like hitting my sweet spot right now. So I uh, my first job actually was working at a local restaurant in Southbury, Connecticut called Leo's. And it's like the best breakfast restaurant, I feel like, in the state. Um, they, It's just like the most amazing, delicious breakfast. So I would say like that was definitely one of my favorite spots growing up going to. And then I was a waitress there through high school. Um, and then I just... So I pretty much like all food except for seafood, which I know being from New England is just terrible and everyone always judges me on it. I just can't do seafood. I'm not, I'm not a seafood person. Um, but other than that, like I will try anything and I'll try seafood. I just typically don't enjoy it. Um, holidays. I mean, uh, traditional, I, you know, Thanksgiving, we have our Turkey. We always do a ham too. Uh, the mashed potatoes, the gravy, the stuffing, the cranberry sauce, all the goodies, the sweet potatoes. And, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish as well. So, uh, during Hanukkah, we always do the latkes. We do usually like a roast of some sort. So I, I like the traditional holiday meals. It always kind of brings me back to home. Delicious. I had no clue that you were actually Jewish. You guys yeah. celebrate Hanukkah as well as Christmas. Are you and Will bringing your children into both of the cultures? Yeah. So I, um, I'm like 100% Jewish. Both my parents are Jewish. I was bat mitzvahed back in 1999, not to date myself. Um, and But I do love, I love Christmas. I always enjoyed Christmas growing up. Um, so we actually just decorated for the holidays and we have a beautiful Christmas tree. And at the top of the tree is a Star of David, a Jewish star. <laughs> So we are, what we've decided with the kids is that we will celebrate both holidays. We're going to educate them on both religions and let them kind of take their path and we'll fully support them in whatever they decide. That is super cool. I kind of like that you guys are teaching your kids about both of these spiritualities and both of the cultures and all of the holidays and the different foods and whatnot and allowing them to choose what yeah. they want to decide. I mean, at the end of the day, they might end up wanting to celebrate both which is oh, amazing fun. yeah i think what we what we truly believe is just to to teach them to be good human beings and you know love each other and and just be kind and i think that that's kind of the most important thing in, in most religions so that's what we're going for and that is some excellent advice for those of you guys that are listening right now you guys are listening to jenny dell Former Red Sox sideline reporter, she is actually currently working for CBS Sports. We will be touching upon that shortly. We are now listening to her discuss all about growing up in the Connecticut area, the fact that her parents were actually from Brooklyn, New York, so she had to deal with being a New York sports fan while actually working for Boston Sports. And I know that you guys actually enjoyed going on vacations when you were younger. One of your favorite sports, uh, favorite sports, one of your favorite places to visit was Walt Disney World because your parents had a timeshare there. Yeah. What was that experience like? Oh my gosh. So anytime that, first of all, my grandma also was like a snowbird. So she would be up in Connecticut by us, you know, in the summer. And then in the winter, she would come down to Florida, which is, it's funny because it's 20 minutes from where I, I currently live now. So I spent a lot of time in this uh, area of South Florida, but 
I, I just have the fondest memories of going to Disney. We would probably go once a year. Uh, my parents had a timeshare there. So it was like always cool to, you know, we thought it was like super fancy that we'd go into these timeshares and have our own bedroom. My sister and I had our own room and it was like a big deal. And then just, I remember just spending hours and hours like from morning until fireworks at night, just roaming around the parks and going on all the rides and eating all the food and I, those are those are some good family memories. We would have, you know, our cousins would come in and join us, and my grandma would drive up, and it was always just a special place to go. I cannot wait. Obviously, with Corona and everything that's going on, we're not going anywhere anytime soon. But once the girls get older, I just can't wait to bring my kids there and, and have my parents come down and kind of carry on the tradition. I was just going to ask you that. So have you taken the girls there? I would assume you haven't yet because like you're mentioning with the pandemic and the fact that they are fairly young, yeah. when you guys do get the opportunity to take them to Disney, where's the f first place you would like to take them? And do you have a favorite park there? I mean, Magic Kingdom, you you stroll up on Cinderella's Castle and it's like, you're in a good spot. So I feel like Magic Kingdom is is the epitome of Disney when you think about it just like rolling up that main street and oh, it's right there. <laughs> My so brother that actually recently, that's a great spot. My brother actually just recently proposed to his girlfriend about two weeks oh, ago in that. Disney. Oh, that's awesome. In yeah, he didn't do it at the oh, castle. He didn't actually do it at the castle, but he actually did it at the new Frozen ride. I don't know if, you have, if you've had the opportunity to wow. go on the Frozen ride, but it's a brand new ride and he did it while waiting in line, which is super cute. Oh, I love it. Congratulations to him. That's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. They're actually flying down back to Florida in about a month to go there again because they're super obsessed with it. But I hope you guys get to go back to Florida soon and take the kids there. And switching on over to the fact that, again, you are a big sports person. I know that you played sports when you were younger. One of your favorite sports, you were actively involved with cheerleading both in mm -hmm. high school and college. What was your experience like doing competitive cheerleading and what sparked your interest in getting into that sport in particular? First of all, I wanna thank you for calling it a sport because there's a lot of people out there that might disagree with that. And I would say for anyone that doesn't think it's a sport, go through one practice and I'm telling you, you will change your mind. Um, I always, I, like you said, I, I grew up playing everything, soccer, softball, basketball, tennis, everything. And I always kind of went towards dance. So dance was like my passion growing up. And in middle school, a bunch of my friends that I danced with were trying out for cheerleading. And I, I never did gymnastics. So I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to be for me. Um, but I ended up trying out and making the team. And I loved it. I love the, com the competitive aspect of it. And I love the fact that we also got to cheer on our, especially in high school, our basketball and our football teams. So I always say, like, I was the cheerleader that was teaching the other cheerleaders, like, how like why we were cheering for what we were cheering for. Like I would, I would teach them the plays and, and like, I'm like, okay, so it's a first down. Let me explain that. So I love the fact that I was able to kind of keep my passion for sports, but while doing it on the sideline and like also educate the other girls that were around me that were like, wait, I don't understand this. <laughs> um, but the competitive part was, was the reason that I, I fell in love with it. I mean, it, for anyone that's ever competed in cheerleading, I think anyone that's competed on a, on a stage in some capacity, whether it's, you know, even a football game or basketball, whatever it is, um, just that feeling that you get like before the game and before competition and then going out there and whether you nail it or, you know, hopefully you nail it, just there's, there's nothing that can really replace that feeling. It's like after you get off the mat and you just crushed your competition, you just like nailed your routine. Oh, you feel like you can fly. So I, I loved that. I loved competing nationally. We competed nationally all through high school and in college. Um, I didn't actually cheer my first year at UMass. I thought, okay, I'm done with cheerleading. I did in high school. Now that I'm in college, I want to focus on my studies and just like have a good time and whatnot. And then my best friend that I cheered with in high school, she called me like two days before she was going to Daytona Beach for nationals. And she was cheering at Keene State in New Hampshire at the time. And she was like, this is my first nationals without you. Like, I'm freaking out. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm stressed. So I actually flew to Daytona the next day and I surprised her at nationals. And it was then that I saw UMass compete. 
and they were amazing. And I was like, that's it. I need to try out. I miss it too much. So I went up to the coach and I was like, hi, I'm Jenny. I cheered in high school. Like I go to UMass. I would love to try out for your program. She was like, all right, here's the tryout dates. Like, let's see what happens here. And then um, I was lucky enough to make the team and had a great experience with that at UMass. So I, I just think it's, it's a fun, um, hard sport that you put a lot of time and energy into and the girls and the guys that do it are like true athletes. I 100% agree with you that even just looking at the Patriots cheerleaders, you guys are dancing. You're having to lift up people that weigh over 100 pounds. You're having yeah, to jump up and do like, flips in the air. Like what? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you, were you a flyer and what yeah, is that experience yeah. like? It's, it's wild. I had a lot of broken bones. I had a lot of concussions over the years, um, broken ribs, broken wrists. Like, yeah, it's, it is not easy. And I mean, I, I obviously it's like a team thing, but, the, but people just naturally end up looking up at the flyer because they're the one in the air where the other girls are like holding you. So it's just, you know, there's that added pressure being like, okay, all eyes are on me. Like, Ooh, I don't want to mess up. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. How do you get over that fear of being thrown up in the air and, oh my gosh, what if this person drops me? And after you just mentioned, you already got like a number of injuries from being thrown up in the air and training and practicing and competing. How do you get over that fear of being thrown up in the air and holy crap, somebody might drop me on the ground? Yeah, I think it's like, it's all about trust. And that's, I think in any sport, I mean, a quarterback needs to trust that his receiver is going to catch pass. You know, it's like... I, it's all about trust. And the way that I look at it is like, of course, that's what's going through my mind. I'm like, are they going to catch me? But my base needs to also be like, is Jenny going to flail her arm around and like smack me in the head and give me a concussion or break my nose? Like everyone has fears on different levels. And it's like, as long as you're all working together and, you know, working hard and just making sure you're doing your own job, just like in sports, um, you know, as Bill Belichick would say, like, do your job. It's, you're going to be okay and you're going to fall and it's, you know, mistakes are going to happen, but that's, you just got to trust that you can get back up and not kill someone next time. <laughs> Do you have any funny standout memories from cheerleading, whether that be back in high school or college? Like what was your most memorable moment while cheerleading competitively? And also do you have any favorite places that you travel to, whether that be a, a favorite college that you went to or a different state that you might have gone to? Yeah, I mean, I think high school, like, I loved my experience sharing in college, don't get me wrong, and competing at Nationals in Daytona Beach, you're outside in what they call the band shell, and you're outside basically right next to the beach, and there's thousands of people watching you, and it's like this amazing, fun, wild experience, and it's on TV, and it's like, this big deal. Um, but when I think about my fondest cheerleading memories, I think about high school and I think about those are my best friends that I grew up with from day one. And like I went to kindergarten with, and I was able to travel around the country and compete nationally with them. And, um, I think our first competition was in Myrtle beach. And I believe we, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure we took a bus there from Connecticut. And I, I just remember like it was just such a bonding experience and we ended up winning nationals that year um, and it was our first time competing in nationals so it was that's just something I'll never forget. It sounds like you absolutely crushed it and I love that not only were you a fantastic cheerleader but I really enjoy listening to the fact that you on the side were teaching your teammates Teaching your cheer teammates, okay, guys, we just got a first down. Somebody just got a touchdown. This is why we're actually celebrating. There's yeah. a purpose behind why we are celebrating. Yeah. Even like college, it was like first and 10, do it again, go, go, Minutemen. And the girls were like, I'm sorry, what do they mean, do it again? I'm like, oh, you boy. Okay. <laughs> this is what we're doing here. <laughs> so I love that. That is so cute. And on top of you cheerleading at UMass Amherst, you got a degree in hospitality and tourism management. And you also, I think, minored or double majored with sports marketing. 
What was yeah. the reason behind getting that degree? Were you planning on working in hotels or starting your own restaurant? What was the reason for getting a degree in hospitality and tourism management? I need to ask. Okay. I, people are always like, what? Are, what? Are, you didn't do broadcast journalism? And I'm like, no, not at all. Um, so I actually was going to go to culinary school. So cooking has always been like one of my biggest passions in life. And I was going to go, I was kind of deciding between Johnson and Wales and the Culinary Institute and then UMass was not a backup, but just a school I applied to just because I was like, oh, I should just apply to, you know, another school. Um, and I knew they had a great hospitality and management program there. So initially I wanted to be a chef. And then I was like, I like people too much. I don't think I want to be stuck in the back of the house my whole life. Although I love cooking, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm able to go out and do things and um, meet people. So I was like, maybe I'll go into restaurant management. So then I was like, well, if I'm going to do that, maybe I shouldn't be going to culinary school. And I ended up choosing UMass. And like I said, they had they have an incredible hospitality and tourism management department. And initially, I was going to focus in on restaurant management. But then one of their uh, concentrations was actually event management. So then I was thinking about it. And I'm like, okay, well, what do I want to do with my life? Like, I love cooking, but I could always cook for my family and my friends. I think it would be great to do like marketing and event planning. So in my mind, my dream job was to work for ESPN and do event planning, like help plan a Super Bowl party for ESPN or help plan the ESPYs and do like these massive events. So I changed my concentration to event planning under hospitality and tourism management. And then I picked up a second major. Now, UMass had this really cool program called BDIC, it's bachelor degree with individual concentration. And you could create your own major. So whatever you want to create, you basically have to, and it's a lot of work, you have to put together a curriculum and put all your classes together and get it approved by multiple boards of people to say, this is, this is a degree that I want to create and then study and graduate with. So I created a sport event marketing degree and a lot of the classes were from our sport management department. A lot of them were from the hospitality. There were some in business and so on and so forth. Um, so I created kind of my own major with that. There was someone doing BDIC for like video game engineering. I mean, you could create anything as long as you could prove why it makes sense that you're majoring in this. Um, so my end of my sophomore year, I picked up my second major and then I ended up graduating a semester early um, with the double major in both in business, but HGM and um, sport event marketing. And then I got a job at ESPN right out of college. So it was kind of a whirlwind. <laughs> That's incredible that you were able to sort of incorporate everything and all of your passions into one, the sports, the event marketing, obviously the food, because now you are currently, which we will touch upon a little bit later, you started your own blog, the Simply Delicious, and you actually have a TV show called Campus Eats that you co-host on sometimes. So it's kind of amazing to watch your career sort of unfold where you're able to do all of those passions. Although they're all separate, they're kind of like one entity because you get to live them out, basically have your dream job, which is so amazing. You guys are now listening to Jenny Dell, former Boston Red Sox sideline reporter. She grew up right here in New England. She's talking to us all about Growing up in the New England area, being both a Boston fan, a New York fan, we we're talking about her, her college days, and we are going to be touching upon sports media very shortly, so please stay with us. Before we jump into that, we are going to be mentioning Halio. You guys know that I love Halio Athletica. It's one of my favorite athletic brands. I post about them all the time. Their clothes are so buttery, so soft, so many different colors. They have animal print, pink, blue yellow, navy, army green, literally check out their website, it is amazing. Look good and feel amazing in Halio. Booty lifting, squat proof leggings. Halio LA has leggings and sports bra tops made for every woman, lifestyle and experience. Visit Halio, so that's H-A-L-I-O-L-A.com, like Los Angeles, so HalioLA.com today. Confidence never looks so good in you. So guys, please check out Halio. I'm always rocking and repping their brand. They absolutely rock. Let's just hop right back into it with our girl, Jenny. So Jenny, you absolutely crushed it in college as a cheerleader 
And like you just spoke about earlier, you were able to formulate your own degree in a way. You originally sounded like you wanted to intern at ESPN because you wanted to create or help them create certain events and become an event planner, but it ended up turning into you being an on-camera personality. So let's kind of walk through the steps of what it was like being a young production assistant at ESPN. I'd assume it was in Connecticut. Um, and at the age of 21, I think it's so freaking cool that you were approached in a cafeteria and somebody was like, hey, Jenny, like you would absolutely kill it on camera. Like, have you ever thought about that before? So, yeah. What was it like having that experience happen to you and not even really caring about being on camera? I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it was it was amazing. So I'm, I'm 21. I got a job as a production assistant. Initially, I was going to be um, I applied for a job as a coordinator for basically an assistant for three of the coordinating producers at ESPN. And they were like, you don't want to be our assistant. I was, you know, a little go getter, 21 year old. And I was like, I'll do anything. Cause in my mind, I was like, as long as I get my foot in the door here, I'll be able to work my way up to marketing and do, you know, my dream job of marketing and event planning. So I was willing to do whatever it took to get my feet in the door. And I got offered a position as a production assistant, which was like a temporary position. And I did not know much about production. And these people that I was working with, they study this in college. And I mean, like all over the country, top production, broadcast journalism. I mean, just the, the best of the best. We're all here at ESPN. And, and here I am. And I'm like, okay, I have a lot of work to do. So I worked my butt off and I tried to be the best production assistant out there. And I was lucky enough to work on almost every single sport at ESPN. So I started on the NBA. Then I went to the WNBA. I did Monday night baseball. I did horse racing. I did um, NASCAR. I did Monday night football. I, I literally worked on I did the spelling bee. I mean, I literally worked on every single sport that they had. Um, and I feel like that having that production background has really helped everything that I've done on air and it just being in a production truck in general, you have a much better understanding of what's actually going on inside the truck. So when you're doing sideline on the outside and you're like, okay, why isn't the producer talking back to me or what's the director doing right now? Like I'm asking for help. You realize that there's a million other things going on and like you are not important at this moment. So <laughs> just chill for a sec. Um, so yeah, so I was 21 and I was probably at ESPN for a month and a half at this time. And, um, I was in the cafeteria and this guy approached me and, and you know, I'm the, I'm the new girl and he, we were just like chatting and whatever. And he was, he was super nice. And, and he was like, all right, Jenny, well, it was like really nice chatting with you. Like, good luck the rest of the way. And I was like, thank you. And he was like, you don't remember my name, do you? And I was like, no, I shoot. <laughs> and he was like, all right, all good. All good. He's like, I'll see you around. And I, then I left and I was like, Oh, I'm such an idiot. Like how I need to, start remembering people's names better. Like that's part of being in business. Like just remember someone's name. So I saw him the next day. He's like, did you figure out my name yet? And it was totally in a joking manner. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. So this went on for like a few days. And then finally I was sitting in our, uh, the basement, which is where the production assistants were at the time. And it was like three in the morning. I was going over some work. Like, I don't even know. I was working on the NBA at the time. I don't even know what I was working on. And I looked up and it, cause there are obviously TVs everywhere. And there he was the guy that I'm like, ah, he works on air at ESPN. And it was Matthew Barry. And at the time fantasy football had just started becoming a huge thing. So this, I mean, this is back in 2008 now. So, um, the next day I was in the cafeteria and I was like, so Matthew, and he was like, ah, you figured it out. And he was like, I like your personality. You're fun. He's like, have you ever thought about working on air? And I was like, no, <laughs> like not in the slightest bit. And he was like, all right, well, obviously I do fantasy sports. Like we're trying to get at the time, Molly Karam was like the big ESPN.com girl. And they're like, Molly needs some help with, you know, every, there's a lot of stuff on our plate. Would you want to come audition to work for ESPN.com? And I was like, um, sure. Yeah. Why not? So I ended up, he was like, okay, write up a script. He's like, contact these people and we'll set up a time for you to come and audition. And I was like, all right. So I wrote up some script of God only knows what I wrote about and um, ended up 
going into like, it's like this green room closet basically and reading off a teleprompter, which is something that I never did. And I read my script and I was like, well, I probably just blew that situation. Um, and they called me back and they're like, Hey, we think you have some potential. Would you want to start co-hosting and, and doing some segments for fantasy football? And I was like, sure. <laughs> Why not? So instead of taking a lunch break or, you know, taking a day off, I would come in and I'd shoot these segments for ESPN.com. And it kind of grew into something more and more and more. So it was, at the time, it was Countdown Daily. We were sponsored by IBM. It was like doing fantasy football picks. And then that kind of went into a show. I had a show then uh, with um, Tim Hasselbeck and Teddy Bruschi. And I would do a lot of stuff with Matthew Berry. And Stefania Bell would be our injury girl. I mean, we had like this whole kind of situation. It was all on ESPN.com. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this is incredible. And I started really, really enjoying it but I also loved the behind the scenes and the production aspect of things. So I was working on all these sports and production. And then in my free time, I was doing all the stuff for ESPN.com. And I was like, okay, I need to pick one or the other. Cause I'm working, you know, a hundred and however many hours a week. And I just need to figure out which way I want to try and aim my life at. Um, and that's when the Red Sox job came up. So I was there, I was at ESPN for four years doing kind of both and loving both. And then I was lucky enough to, get the Red Sox job and then everything kind of changed from there. I love how you just walked the listeners through the steps of how, again, out of college, you didn't even have a thought of wanting to be on camera. Not in the slightest. No, not in the slightest had zero training, literally just wanted to help set up events and be involved in the marketing. And you have this top name ESPN, sports personality be like, Hey Jenny, I like your personality. I want you to get involved. And I, it's, to me, it sounds like fate. It literally was fate. You're meant to be on camera and you're at the right place at the right time. And I actually loved looking back at one of your recent posts. It looks like, well, wasn't that recent? Cause you, it looks like you posted it, um, in January of 2019. Okay. But in January of 28th of 2019, you threw up a throwback post on Instagram from 2010. And you oh said, you said, flashing back to my first Super Bowl in 2010, working the red carpet with ESPN, 23 years old, starting my dream career. So I kind of wanted to ask you, what was it like at 23 years old, working that red carpet at that Super Bowl, again, not really having much training and just being so excited that your new career is starting? I think that that's what made it work, if that makes sense, because I was so young and I was obviously like hungry for success and, and like to just make everyone proud and, and do a good job. But I think because I didn't have all that added pressure of like, okay, this is the dream job. You need to go out there. Don't mess up. Don't like, you have to be perfect. I never had that. because so I was like, this is not even something I ever thought about doing. Now, if this was, if I was given an opportunity to like plan the Super Bowl halftime show, I probably would have been like scared out of my mind. But because this was something that kind of fell into my lap in a way, I was like, I'm just going to enjoy every second of this. Like I'm 23. I'm going to the Super Bowl. I'm meeting all these celebrities. I'm like doing these fun interviews. I was like, okay, well, what, did, what do I think people at home want to hear? And that's kind of been the way that I've always looked at working on air is like, I don't, and even when I got a job with the Red Sox, I was like, why did you pick me? Because at that time, I had four years under my belt of working for ESPN.com, but I had never done live TV. I'd never covered a baseball game in any capacity. And I'm like, people would kill for this Red Sox job. Like, why me? And they were like, because you were real. And because you came in here and you're like, listen, I'm not going to be perfect. And I'm probably going to mess up, but I'm going to give 150% and I'm going to do the best that I can. And I'm not going to fake it. And and they were like, that's what we need in Boston because people see through, you know, fake real quick. And they're like, and that's why we liked you is because you, you're like, we feel like we could sit down and have a beer with you and watch the game and have like a fun conversation. And that's, I feel like why I've maybe done, you know, well in the industry is because I'm not trying to put on this like, hi, I'm Jenny Dell and I'm perfect. And because I'm not like, I'm far from that. And I fully realize that, but I do work my butt off. So, you know, I think, I think that's why it's worked. And I think that's why it worked back then. And I love how real and down to earth you are. And the fact that you basically are sitting here saying that 
you push the pressure aside. You were kind of just like going with the flow, showcasing your personality and literally just being you and the opportunity to work for ESPN sort of fell into your lap. And then the Nesson sideline reporting job sort of fell into your lap because you were being so real. So let's switch into that. The fact that you left Connecticut, left ESPN, switch on over to the Boston area, working yeah. alongside Nesson for a couple of years. What was it like being the Red Sox sideline reporter? Because for years, you were the girl that, like even myself, like we looked up to you. We were like, Jenny Dell is like the girl, like she's working for the Red Sox, like look at her killing it. So what was it like being the Red Sox sideline reporter? And what was your initial experience like working for them? So it's funny that you say that because like the way that you looked at me in that sense, which is like crazy to me, is the way that I looked at Heidi Watney, who I replaced, you know, she left and then is killing it with MLB network now, but I looked at Heidi like this goddess and I was like, how am I supposed to come and do anything close to like what Heidi did? And she's like this perfect, like bleach blonde, gorgeous, smart, articulate human being. And I was like, okay, here I am. I'm like, what am I doing? Um, so as I said, I, I tried to be myself, but there is a lot of pressure in Boston and I learned very quickly that um, you you basically just need to do your job and do it to the best of your ability and not like listen to talk radio and stay off a bar stool and stay off the blogs because you'll go insane. Um, it was tough. I mean, I was 25, I think. And you kind of get like thrust into this weird pseudo local celebrity and you're like, I'm a nobody from Connecticut and I don't understand why people care about, you know, what I'm wearing today or they want to, you know, it's, it's, it was very strange. And I don't think I was quite ready for, um, the influx of media attention that came. Um, but I cherished every second of it. I mean, it was, it was like, I was living in this kind of weird fantasy world and, uh, there was, many days where I went home and cried after a game because it was just like the pressure was like, Oh my God, I don't know. What am I doing with my life? Um, but looking back, it was probably the best two years of my life uh, working for NASA and working for the Red Sox. And I met my husband there and um, I want to change a second of it, but it's, it's like, it's a scary, it's a scary place. And, and Nesson did, and my, my production crew and Don and Jerry, they did such a good job making you feel comfortable and welcome. And, you know, all of the Boston sports media, they're amazing. I still talk to a ton of those guys and girls to this day. And you kind of create like this little Boston family and support group because it's, it's not an easy place to work. That's for sure. Yeah, I can't even imagine being that young, hardly having that much training, not going to school for broadcast journalism, and literally just being like thrown to the wolves of the Boston sports fans. Because I wanted to ask you, how wild and crazy was it working with the Boston sports fans behind you at Fenway Park at all times? Because, I mean, you know, girl, you know those Boston sports fans. I'm a Boston sport. I grew up in the Boston area. Yeah. I would say Boston and New York fans are pretty comparable, but what was it like having those people like breathing down your back while you're trying to report? It's I I loved every second of it because I felt I would always try and talk to everyone as much as I could while like focusing in on the game. So if anyone's been to Fenway, I know the sideline reporters now on the first base side, but when I was working there, I was along the dugout by the visitors dugout on the third base side. And you literally have fans right behind you. I mean, like you're sitting here and there are people right behind you. So you get to know the people that have those seats. It becomes like a little family. Um, you know, a couple of them were, were, were like company seats. So you would just meet all these new people all the time. But like they would very quickly tell you if you were wrong on something and you had to be on it. Like, do not mispronounce a name. Like, do not mess up a date. Don't. I mean, you literally had to be perfect or your name was going to be like spewed across Boston sports media for the next week. So there was a lot of pressure, but it was, I mean, like you said, Boston fans are the best fans, in my opinion, in the world. And the fact that I got to represent them in some way for some time was 
amazing. And it's something that like, I'll never, I'll never forget. And I just remember like the first time that people were like, Ooh, can I have a picture? Or, like, can you sign an autograph? I was like, a me? And they're like, yes. And they were like, Oh, this made my day. And I'm like, Oh my God, I could make someone's day. Like, I don't, I, it's just, it's wild. And even to this day, if someone like stops for a picture or an autograph or like, I'll get requests or DMS to do podcasts or whatnot. I, I still, to this day, I'm like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Like that I'm, I'm just honored to be in this position. I love how humble you are. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head. This is why you're so successful because you are literally just Jenny Dell from Connecticut and you're not acting like this big showboat person from like LA or New York. That's like, I'm yeah. all hoity hoity and I have to be a cookie cutter. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. I wanted to ask you, what was it like celebrating the 2013 world series? And if you had any other favorite, most memorable moments working alongside the Boston Red Sox? Oh gosh, that was, I mean, it's, it was a dream. It was a dream come true being, you know, a part of the broadcast team for the 2013 team. And that was a special year. Just um, you talk about favorite moments and this is definitely not a favorite moment, but something that I'll hold close to my heart forever is just being in Boston during the marathon bombing and, you know, representing the Red Sox during that whole period and being able to talk to all the first responders and people that were affected by it, you know, personally. And, um, it was something that I'll never forget. And I think that when you look back at 2013 as a whole, that's the city just kind of came together. And to be a small part of that is something that I'll hold, you know, in a very special place forever. So um, it was like Boston was destined to win the World Series that year. And I was lucky to be along for the ride. Going along with you talking about the Boston Marathon bombing, what was it like listening to obviously Big Poppy give his Boston Strong speech? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, going along with Big Poppy, did you have any favorite athletes that you enjoyed interviewing? I guess both for ESPN and also with the Red Sox. Was there anybody in particular that you liked to interview because they had like a more welcoming, cool personality versus some other players? But I guess how was Big Poppy and what was it like listening to him uh, give that speech? during that time where everybody needed to come together. He, so you talk about like favorite athletes to ever interview and David Ortiz is definitely like the top of the list. Like he is like, when you think of David Ortiz and you think of who he is in a sports world, the person that he is like behind the scenes, you love him even more which is like hard to even think about because he's like this amazing cuddly teddy bear, like, an incredible athlete, you know, strong human being. And then he was like a big brother to both Will and, and to me. And um, I loved interviewing him because you never knew what he was going to say, but you knew that he was always going to have an impact. And being on the field during that speech in 2013 is something I'll never forget. But he just, I mean, he literally, especially during post games, I remember, so if there was a walk-off win, I would interview whoever was like the walk-off hero and it would go around the PA system at Fenway. And you always ask, like, it's not, you don't ask like the in-depth baseball questions during that. It's more like, let's get the crowd riled up because, oh my God, we just had a walk-off win. And I would love when it was David Ortiz because you just knew that the whole place, even though they're already going to go wild regardless, like when Poppy speaks at the end, it's like everyone would just go nuts. And I would basically just, I don't even know, I'd just, tee him up and be like, all right, David. And it was, I don't know. He just, he's a special, special guy. And I was lucky to be a part of, of the, a season where, you know, he was exceptional and he's, he's like even better off the field. Like he is just a genuinely amazing human being. He definitely seems like an amazing human being. And I love that you were able to speak about him. And especially during that time where again, Boston had to come together after the Boston Marathon bombing and you being a part of that time where literally Boston had to come together in order to be Boston strong. Yeah. Sounds like you absolutely killed it while being a uh, Red Sox reporter. I loved hearing all about it. We're gonna switch on over right now to CBS reporting. So you guys are now listening to Jenny Dell. She literally has been dominating the Boston sports world since I believe 2012, up and coming, out of college, Again, she started off as a production assistant at ESPN, switched on over to Nesson. She is now with the CBS. I know you were 
focusing more on football and basketball now. So what is it like transitioning from mainly working with baseball and professional athletes in the baseball world now working with football? You have to like do some type of special training. Do you have to read books? What is it like being a pro football reporter? So I, I always like football was my sport growing up. So as much as I enjoyed like hanging on the couch, watching baseball with dad, like football was the sport that I loved the most. So to be able to cover, you know, football in both professionals, NFL and college football is something special. So I remember my first, uh, my first game that I had with CBS, it was a preseason game in Indy covering the NFL and I had never covered a football game before in my life. So it was like getting thrown to the NFL world with Ian Eagle and Dan Fouts and like the amazing crew at CBS. And I was like, holy crap, what am I doing? It was one of those moments, kind of like when I got the Red Sox job, I was like, holy crap, what am I doing? Um, and it was incredible. And I, I just remember learning so much in that first year. Tracy Wolfson was a, a huge, huge help in every way. And football is just like a different animal, just in general. Like baseball, you're sitting next to the dugout. You kind of have your stories. You don't, it's not like huge on injury reports because you're just getting what you can from, um, from the PR people and whatnot, and uh, you're not running around a field. And then I'm not saying it's an easy job whatsoever. Like sideline reporting in general, any sport is is time consuming and a lot of hard work. Um, but football, when you're actually like physically running around a field for four quarters, you're like, who? After a game, I'm like, okay, I need to sit down and have a glass of wine and like chill because it is it's intense. I mean, you're it's like you're you just ran a marathon. Um, but it was, it's, it's fun. I love football. Like I said, it's always been my favorite sport. It's fun to cover it. It's, um, there's, it's always exciting. Like I remember there would be some games, especially in 2012 when the Red Sox, like were not very good. And it's like, okay, another Tuesday night game. And I'm, I'm not saying anything bad about, you know, 2012 or whatnot, but it was just like, Oh, nobody cares about this right now in the grand scheme of things. Like the Red Sox are out of the playoffs already, blah, 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 blah. I feel like football, it's like every game is like almost a Super Bowl. Like every game is exciting. Every game, like you never know what's going to happen. You never know who's going to win. Like this could change the whole season right here. Um, so I've just enjoyed covering it like greatly over the last, I think it's been seven years, eight years now that I've been with CBS, which is crazy to think about. Uh, but I love, I love every second of it. I love hearing how much you enjoy transitioning from one sport to the other, which leads up into my next question. What is the future for Jenny Dell? Do you want to potentially cover another sport? Like I could see you alongside, actually, I just recently interviewed her and she has a super chill personality. I could see you guys co-hosting together at UFC, Laura Sanko. Would you ever want to do anything with MMA or get involved with the boxing world? What is the future for you, sports reporting? And would you ever take on a sport that you probably don't know much about? Yes. I, and that's what makes this job so fun. And I am so lucky because I've had opportunities to work on sports that I did not know much about and learn about it. And um, for the last three, two years, three years, three years, uh, I've covered the world's strongest man competition for CBS. And it's like, what? Like, so the first year CBS called me and uh, my boss said, hey, Got kind of a random one for you. Have you ever watched those world's strongest man competitions? And I'm like, yeah, where they like pull cars and trucks and like, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, would you want to do sideline for it? I was like, yes. And he was like, okay, it's in Africa. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yes, count me in. <laughs> so that was three or four years ago. Um, and I've, I got to go to the Philippines for it. I got to go to Africa for it. Like it is literally, that's something I never thought I would ever do in my entire life. And you're standing by me is like, I mean, literally the mountain from game of Thrones is how Thor Julius Bornstein. It was like one of the guys, but it's like, you're standing next to these like mountain men and doing these interviews and just learning an entire new world is something that I loved doing. Um, I got to work a world robotics competition 
like just random stuff that I'm like, okay, I know nothing about this. I'm going to just do as much research and learn as much about it as possible. And then just like relish in the experience. Cause when would I ever think I'm going to be in Africa interviewing like a giant human being? Never. <laughs> but, like, let's bring it on. So I am willing to try anything. Just ask and I will be there. <laughs> I love it. I'm glad that I asked that question because sometimes people are so stuck with like either uh -huh. just one sport or they're, they're stuck in like this comfort zone where they don't want to explore. And it sounds like you literally are just like up for anything. But it sounds like anything. that probably stems from you kind of with like the no pressure, like, Hey man, I didn't even want to be on camera to begin with, but now I'm just killing it. So I'll take on all the fun jobs and see kind of like what happens. I think that is so cool. I love it. I love it. That's what makes this job so fun. It's like, you just never, you never know where it's going to take you. And like, of course I love football. I love basketball. I love covering baseball. I love like the major sports, but like bring on the random ones. Like I want to, I want to experience all this stuff. Amazing. <laughs> you guys, right. You guys are now listening to Jenny Dell, former Boston Red Sox reporter. You guys just listen to her talk all about her experience working in Boston as a sideline reporter. She is now currently working for CBS. Please stay tuned because we are going to jump in a little bit and talk about her family life a bit. She is currently married to former Boston Red Sox third baseman, Will Middlebrook. She has two adorable girls. Stay with us before we get into that. Please guys give a call at 508-361-0519. Again, 508-361-0519. That phone number is to Green Team Junk Removal. You guys know that they are amazing. They are good friends of mine. Fred Collin is super cool. We actually just went on a really amazing hike together yesterday, my boyfriend and I and our dogs with Fred and his wife. But they actually own a really cool company. Again, guys, 508-361-0519 called Green Team Junk Removal. You hit them up. They literally will show up at your business, your house, a school, wherever you need items removed, they will eco-friendly get rid of it. Your items will not end up in a landfill, which is the best part about it. They're following all the COVID, all the COVID um, situations. That way you don't get COVID. So literally hit them up. They will help you out. And they actually donate a lot of their items to local charities. So again, Green Team Junk Mool is the place to be. Let's jump right back into it with Jenny. So Jenny, we've been crushing this interview. I know we have not a lot of time left, so I want to be able to squeeze in the fact that you have campus seats. You're obviously married, positive pop. We have a lot to cram into like 15 Let's minutes. <laughs> Let's crush it. So we know right now that you are currently married to former Boston Red Sox, third baseman Will Middlebrooks. What is it like being married to a professional baseball player, having those two young daughters, meeting him in Boston? Walk us through the steps of what that was like. Ay, ay, ay. Well, this could be a whole hour show. Um, no, Will, uh, Will was like, I always laugh because people are like, did you know right when you met him that it was like, that was going to be your husband? I'm like, no, not in the slightest. He was like this little like 23 year old cutie that just came up and was crushing it in Boston. And he was like so sweet and innocent. And um, <laughs> it's just, it's our, our love story should be written into like a fairy tale someday. And I, I hope that we're able to share it from start to finish at some point. But like, once we got to know each other, I think we both knew that there was something special there. And I, you know, people are always like, Oh, did you date athletes? And I was like, never, I and I never would have. And the reason that I was willing to risk it with will is because I knew that there was a reason that we were brought together and that he was going to eventually be my husband once we like got to know each other well. But, um, it was tough at first. We, so we dated like in secret in Boston for a while. We lived in an apartment together in Southie and like, we would have to leave at different times and we weren't allowed to be seen in public together. And we'd go to the field at different times. And like his, the team knew my, my production crew knew my bosses knew, um, but none of the fans knew. And, so I just treated him like every other Red Sox player. Um, you know, if he was struggling, I'd ask him questions about struggling. If he was, if he had to walk off hit, I was interviewing him at the end of the game. And it was like, it was like we had a completely different um, professional and personal life. And uh, I think we did a good job of, of keeping that separate. And then when I was ready to move on, I ended up going to CBS is when we decided to come out like publicly that we were together. And I don't think it was until we actually got engaged in July of 2014 that people were like, oh, wait, they're seriously dating? Like, she's not just like 
with this Red Sox player. And I'm like, no, like we are seriously together. Um, so we've been, we're coming up on our five-year wedding anniversary. We have two beautiful daughters, Madison and Mackenzie. Maddie just turned two. Kenzie is about to turn one. So it has been a wild few years. Um, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I love our little family. And um, Will unfortunately got hurt in February of 2018. So his baseball career is uh, done. And um, it actually, the timing of everything, like I feel like everything happens for a reason, not that I want him to be hurt or anyone to ever get hurt, but he has been able to be home with our daughters and is the most incredible father. And we have like a, a solid little family life here. So it's been, it's been amazing. I love how you're opening up about your relationship relationship and how you guys met, obviously, while you were a sideline reporter and working in the Boston area. So I wanted to ask you sort of what was it like? I guess you kind of already described it, having to hide it from the public. Obviously, the team probably knew, like you mentioned, and the production company obviously had to know about it. But were you like at times ever nervous, like, oh, my gosh, like if this gets out, I might lose my job. And obviously, like you mentioned, you knew you were going to end up with him. So you were willing to risk your job, which I find super admirable. And like you said, you should like write a book on it because I think this story is so great because here you guys are about to celebrate your fifth wedding anniversary. You guys have two young children and you're still sports reporting. So at the end of the day, when love calls, you got to just go for Run. it. Just do it. Just do um, it. Yeah, no, it was scary. It was scary though. Um, but I was, I, I knew in the back of my mind that I would somehow come out on top. But when I, when we first initially came out publicly, like it was, it was national media and people didn't know that we were living together and didn't know that we were about to get engaged. And um, there was a lot of judgment passed and that was something that was very difficult. And I think that I knew it was going to be okay eventually, but at the time it was very hard. Um, and it, it was also difficult because on the flip side, like Will was getting applauded. He's like, well, you got the Red Sox reporter. And here I am getting like shamed and potentially, you know, out of a job um, because people didn't know exactly what was going on. So it was it was a trying, I would say, six months until kind of the story came out of, of the fact that we were actually in love and going to be together and then people were like oh okay they did find love it wasn't just like this sketchy situation um but yeah it was it was tough there were definitely times where i was like i don't i don't know how this is gonna go i don't know what this is gonna do to my career but i also knew and you know and talking with my parents like i knew that a career is something that that you do because you, you know, you, it's something that you love and it's something that provides money and it provides, you know, stability, but like love, if you have like true love, like that's what's most important. So I tried to follow my heart with that one. I'm so happy that we were talking about this because I feel like the Boston fan base, myself, including when I was younger, we were all kind of like, I wonder what's happening, like what's going on. So to hear it like out of your mouth, like we all knew that you guys were dating. Like when the story came out, it's like, you again being as real as you were on the camera like there's no way that it was not real love i mean here you guys are five well i mean you've been together more than five years obviously because yeah. you, you've been married almost five years at this point yeah. with two kids it's eight years something like that <laughs> almost no. a decade together That's weird. Um, i wanted to ask you we'll switch it over to something more positive because obviously you just talked about the stress of meeting each other having to hide your relationship while working with the red sox and him still playing for the red sox what was your first date like? Like, did you guys have to like hide inside because you weren't allowed to be seen in public? Did he take you to dinner? And I want to hear a little bit about the proposal and your wedding because you look stunning. Oh, thank but you. First off, first date. What the first hell was the first date. date like? So first date actually happened. Uh, it was during a Red Sox Yankee series in New York. Um, our friend lived in a city and she she knew we were together and she was like if you want to go to a place that like no one's gonna like you know paparazzi you or see you or whatever she gave us this name of this little wine bar in new york and will and i left the hotel took separate at different times took separate taxis to this little wine bar and i don't i think it actually closed down now it's called vero and we sat down and we had like a cheese platter and wine and that was our first date it was in new york city um 
it was, I think there was an off night. It must have been, or it might have been after a game. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, that was like the first official date. And I think we both knew then, like, okay, like this is this is something that's gonna be a forever situation, which is crazy to think about now. Um, but yeah, so that was first date, and then it was like a lot. We never, we never would go in public in Boston. Like that would never happen. Um, but when we were out on the road, we would try to like if there were off days or like you know breakfast or whatever, we would try to like sneak out and find a spot without people seeing us. So it's so scandalous when you say it, when I say it like this, like that's, but yeah. Um, it almost sounds more fun that you guys had to hide it. Like the grand scheme of things, it probably made it more fun. It made it, it made it fun for the first, like, oh uh, yeah. For the first like nine months. And then after that, I was like, I just want to like go out and get like a bagel with you in Boston. Like, I'm like, can we just like go get a cup of coffee? And we're like, nope, nope, we can't. And at that point you're just like, okay, I'm done with this like sneaking around thing. Um, but yeah, it was, it. It was wild. It was a wild experience. Uh, and then he proposed. We were in Newport, Rhode Island in 2014 during All-Star break. I had no idea it was coming. And he proposed on the Cliff Walk in Newport. If you've ever been there, it is like the most beautiful scene ever. You have like the waves crashing up on one side and like these mansions on the other. And you walk along the cliffs. And um, he actually surprised me after the proposal. Obviously, as a female who just got engaged, you call all your best friends, you call your family, like you're like, oh my God, I just got engaged. Like, here's a picture of the ring. Ah, like, this is what happened. And then we went back to the place where we were staying. And he, I love Mexican food, like Mexican is my favorite. So he was like, I have a, I have dinner reservations at this place, Diego's down on Bowen's Wharf at eight o'clock. And I'm like, yes, like Mexican, awesome. And I walked in and he had surprised me. He flew in his entire family, all my best friends, my goddaughter, um, all my best friends from Connecticut, from Boston, everyone was there, uh, my whole family. And it was like one of the most, I, I was, I've never been so surprised in my life. Like it was one of the most amazing nights of my life, days of my life. And uh, so he nailed it. He like knocked it out of the park with that one. And then we got married about two years later. We were living in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we actually only had, everyone's always like, oh. So our anniversary is on Valentine's Day, which was not planned. Like I, and for everyone who's planned it, like good for you. We are just like not that couple that's like, let's get married on Valentine's Day. But it was the literally the only weekend off in 2016. I just had finished working with Super Bowl for CBS the week before, and Will started spring training on Tuesday of the week after. So it was literally, if we wanted to get married anytime that year, that was the only date available. So we got married on Valentine's Day on our one weekend off, and we never got, we didn't go on a honeymoon because we were both working. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I actually <laughs> fully enjoy that story because. Actually, I'm going to a baseball wedding February 6th. And hey, one of my best friends, she was a, her and I both competed on this TV show called MTV's The Challenge. And she is marrying somebody that's in the Houston Astros organization. And she's like, Britt, it's the only weekend I had open because he's about to leave for spring training camp like the following week. So yeah, she's literally getting married in two months and that's the only weekend they had available. So girl, I totally understand it. I love it. I love it. I totally get it. I totally get it. So you guys are now listening to Jenny Dell. She's talking all about meeting former boss Red Sox, Will Middlebrooks. He obviously was a third baseman. I have some really cool stats on him. So Will was actually a fifth round draft pick in the 2007 MLB draft. He grew up in Texas. Uh, Will was originally a shortstop, which I found super cool. I found this obviously by doing my research, but was converted into a third baseman by the Red Sox. Super freaking cool. I know that that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, he, so I wanted to ask you, like, how is it experiencing the World Series together? Obviously, you guys were both involved in the 2013 World Series. Did you guys obviously enjoy celebrating it together? Were you guys allowed to celebrate together? Well, so the whole team obviously knew we were together. But um, so after each, like, division win, so after um, – the ALCS after the LDSCS and then the World Series, uh, David would throw, David Ortiz would throw like a huge party at his house to celebrate each kind of next step. So 
I was at the parties as Will's girlfriend, but then it's like, oh, but the reporter's here, but everyone was like super cool. And I think that we had a very good understanding of like, listen, I know how to keep my mouth shut on certain things. And like, that's part of my job and you know, whatnot. Um, but it was, those were some of the most like fun events <laughs> that we would be able to celebrate. And then it was funny because after when the Red Sox finally did win at Fenway, I'm down on the field and there's like champagne being popped and you know cameras everywhere and whatnot and all the players were coming up and like giving me big bear hugs and then I saw Will who's my serious boyfriend who I live with and I was like congratulations Will because I didn't want people to like capture us hugging or any or people to like question anything so I'm like hugging everyone else on the team I'm like oh my gosh and then I'm like Mr. Middlebrooks like congrats on the world series win. How does it feel? You know, <laughs> so it was, it was funny, but then we went out that night. I don't, I mean, I don't think anyone on that team or significant others slept for, for a while, <laughs> but there was, it was a good time. But uh, the initial interaction after they actually won the world series was something I'll never forget. <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds like you guys enjoyed celebrating together when you could, especially at the after party with Big yeah. Poppy and some of the former teammates for the 2013 um, World Champions. Speaking of celebrating, we'll kind of wrap up the segment about you and Will because I want to switch on over to Cameron Stewart shortly. But before Love we get into that, again, on the celebration topic, obviously your uh, wedding anniversary is coming up in the cup couple months in February. Do you guys have any um, plans for that? Are you guys going on a vacation? You're gonna be home with the kids. What is your celebration gonna be like for your upcoming wedding anniversary? So I always said for five years, I wanted to go to Greece. Like that was, I've never been to Greece. I wanted to do like the whole, you know, stay outside and be in a bathtub and looking over at the water. <laughs> um, I think due to COVID we are, not going to be traveling. Um, so maybe we'll have a quiet night at home with the kids or maybe we'll have, you know, someone watch the kids and maybe we can find, we're taking things very serious here in Florida. Um, Will and I have been like pretty strictly quarantined um, for the entire year. So maybe we'll find an outdoor restaurant that has a nice patio that's spaced apart. We can go out for a dinner outside and celebrate, but we'll see. We, have, we haven't set any plans yet. I don't think Greece is happening though. Maybe we'll move that to the 10 year anniversary. <laughs> well, congratulations to both you and Will. It sounds like you guys were able to obviously make your relationship work and obviously both of your careers work because here you are still crushing it in the sports world. So if you guys are listening, go for love. Career comes second because at the end of the day, eventually everybody phases out of their jobs and I'd rather have a lifetime of love and children and family versus chasing a job and, and ended up working out and in, in your benefit where you ultimately have both. So again, kind of like with you getting um, the ESPN production assistant job, everything happening, I truly believe was fate for you. And you just like following your own nat natural intuition, like led you to who you are today. And I very admirable for you. Like, so like, love it. I just want to switch it over because I literally found this super cute story. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this whole situation, but Jenny, again, going off of the fact that she literally is like one of the most sweet hearted people ever. She actually back in 2014, and I guess Will must have allowed this to happen. A cute little 16 year old named Cameron Stewart really wanted to take Jenny to the prom. So apparently he like set up a whole Twitter campaign to try to get her attention. And during the World Series, supposedly he set up like little post-it notes to try to get her attention. Like he did whatever he could to be like, hey, Jenny, can you come to the prom with me? Apparently he got your attention because you ended up going. What was it like going to a high school prom and basically making this kid's little little kid's dream come to life? Cam Stewart, my guy. So uh, the whole thing started, I forgot, I think it was like, it was a, ha so Twitter had, like Twitter was out, but it was like not what it is today. So he Cam started the hashtag and it was like a ridiculously long hashtag. It was like, have Cam Stewart take Jenny Dell to the prom. Like it wasn't just like <laughs> something that was like quick and snappy. And I remember that we were, it, was, it all started, we were at a game and my director was like, oh, Jenny, this, this kid has a sign that he wants to take you to prom and there's like a hashtag on it. And so Don and Jerry were like, oh, Jenny, look at this, blah, blah, blah. And we kind of like made it into like this little thing. 
And I was like, I need to go find that kit. Cause you know, I don't know. I'm, I was like, I want to go meet him, you know? So I found out where he was sitting and, and, you know, we ended up chatting and he was like, well, can you come to prom? And I was like, well, when is prom? Like I need details and so on and so forth. And he's like, what about if I get, and I, I forgot the number. I don't know if it was like a hundred thousand retweets or whatever it was. He's like, what if I get all these retweets? Will you come to prom? I was like, deal, you know? And so he ended up getting the amount that we agreed upon. And uh, you know, we exchanged contact information. He would, he would have people like have the ha the hashtag written on, um, post-it notes and randomly people would like come to me at Fenway and like hand me the post-it note, like have Cam Stewart take Jenny to the prom. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, so I ended up showing up at Cam's house and it was Rockland, Rockland high school. And, um, first of all, I had to go prom dress shopping, which was very stressful. I'm like, I need to like look good for this prom, you know, but the prom dresses that girls were wearing those days. I mean, I was like, I am not wearing, you know, nothing to the prom. <laughs> I was like, I got to find like a classic, classy dress that maybe I can reuse to wear to like another wedding or something. So found a dress, showed up to prom. He had the limo, all of his friends. We did the pre pictures. You know, I had the little, I got him a corsage. Like we did the whole shebang. And then we went to the prom together. And after like we went, it was like dancing, hanging out. Then we had dinner and he was like, okay, like you can leave, you know, if you want now. And I was like, leave. I was like, heck no. Like I am, I'm spending the night here. Like, well, I'm not going anywhere. So we had the best time. He ended up winning prom King. Uh, we danced the night away. It was so much fun. I loved every second of it. I, you probably don't know this, but one of my first, jobs was to be a dance motivator at bar and bat mitzvahs in new york and long island so like dancing <laughs> was like just makes me happy so we had so much fun we took the limo back we facetimed will in the limo back so i think cam probably knew before most people that will and i were dating and he was a huge red sox fan so that was like something fun for him and we keep in touch now to this day cam and i he's awesome <laughs> that is so cute. I am so happy that I came across the story because I just find it so cute that you were like, you know what? I'm going to make this kid's dream and so be his prom date and literally just like show up at his house, go to prom. I love how you made like the full night out of it. Oh, yeah. He, he got the FaceTime Will. Like literally you probably made this kid's life. He he said it was like he was like this is the best night of my life. I'm sure he's had much better nights since then, but uh he, we had we had a lot of fun. It was like I think people thought that I was gonna like mail it in and go and like take a picture and then leave. I was like, oh no, no, no. Like I am I'm dedicated to this prom right here. <laughs> Super cute. And it sounds like a good way to give back to the community as well. And you guys now listening know that the boss babes are all about giving back to the community. So Jenny, I wanted to ask you again, going along with the fact that you went to prom with Cameron Stewart, obviously a big fan of yours. I know that you work alongside or used to work alongside the Jimmy Fund, the Greater Boston Food Bank, the Joe Andrewsy Foundation, and you do some public speaking. So let's discuss a little bit how you give back to the community, both in Boston and what you do currently. And I'm sure you and will probably give back a little bit to your your hometowns, yeah. both Connecticut and Texas. How do you guys yeah. give back to your communities? I think that that when I first started working in television, I was, I always would second guess my career path in the beginning. Cause I'm like, what am I doing to make the world better? Like change the world for the better in any way, you know, I'm just sitting here like talking X's and O's and sports. And then I, especially with working at um, Fenway with Boston, it's like you then have a platform to raise awareness and funds and and so much for these local charities and the red sox uh, out of any team that will ever played for was the most charitable organization that i've ever seen and the jimmy fund was the forefront of that and i got to meet so many people that work with the jimmy fund that i just fell in love with and uh whether it was just like hosting an event for them or you know speaking on their behalf during Red Sox game or donating or doing the Jimmy fund marathon on TV. It's like anything that I could do to help raise money or donate myself uh, in any way just made it all worthwhile. And I think that going to the hospital and doing the visits with the kids and, you know, Will was the Jimmy fund rep for the Red Sox when he was there. And I think that that was just something that was so important to the both of us. And 
quickly after I worked, you know, with the Jimmy Fund, my best friend's son was diagnosed with kidney cancer and went to the Jimmy Fund when he's, he was three months old. So it went from being just like something that I did because I wanted to give back to something that now I was seeing like in real life, the effect that they have on people that were living on, you know, kind of the flip side of things. And it made me want to do even more because they're literally one of the most amazing organizations that's out there. And then I was introduced, I was in, uh, introduced to the Joe and Druzy foundation through, through that and the work that they do to, and it, I love what the Andrews do because it's, it's the way that I can explain it in a, in a fast manner is you have to think about all the bills that pile up and not just the medical bills, but for people that have a child that has cancer or is going through something, they have to dedicate themselves to that kid. So they might be out of work or they might be, you know, maybe they're getting help with medical bills, but what about their mortgage and what about their phone bill and what about feeding their families? You know, there's all these things that people don't even think about because they're like, oh, well, maybe I'll donate to help them medically. It's like, okay, but now what about all this other stuff? And that's where the Andrews come in and really do an incredible job of, you know, providing funds and awareness to these families. So to be able to host events for them, um, obviously with COVID and, and everything going on, I wasn't able to host this year. I'm hoping to get back out to Boston and they usually host it at, in Foxborough, have the event at Patriots place or, you know, at Gillette. Uh, so it's just giving back in any way possible. Um, during this quarantine, you know, food drives, that's something that's been huge. So Will and I were able to, you know, sign baseball cards, something that's nothing to us, you know, it takes two seconds and we were able to raise a lot of money for the greater Boston food bank. So it's like anything that we can do to help give back in any way or raise awareness about anything, any organization that needs help. Like, like I am all about that. Like I am lucky to have a platform in order to do that. So like, use me. <laughs> that's what I said. I am so thankful that you guys are able to give back in great ways. Part of the reason why I started this sports podcast is for that specific reason. I think you and I chatted about it a little bit before even starting the show, but way before the pandemic hit, my co-host and I actually used to specifically go to Boston sports charities. And one of them was actually the Joe Andrews Foundation. We are very heavily involved with the Boston Bruins Foundation and work alongside the Celtics and it's just so great to be able to highlight athletes and what they do both on and off the field. And that's a big part of this show. And that's why you and I are talking about it now. So I think it's so cool that you guys are giving back in such a big way, both in the past and the present. And I know we're about to wrap up shortly. So I do want to hit upon some of your food and fun. You guys are now listening to Jenny Dell. This girl kills it at life and she absolutely loves food. We talked about it a little bit earlier, how she is a big foodie. So she actually started this really cool, I think it's a blog, uh -huh. but it's called Simply Delicious. So it's obviously a play on words with her maiden last name because now her last name is Middlebrooks, of course, but it's called Simply Delicious. She actually has a page up on Instagram. So if you guys are interested in checking it out, please do. But she started it with her former roommate, Tracy, and it's literally like a, a sick page with all different types of food recipes, <laughs> sweets, treats i actually loved the it looks really great i'm gonna actually try it she had something on there called the chia seed pudding oh, it's um, so crispy coconut chicken looked literally to die for and the beef bar barbacoa tacos looked wow. mouth-watering so what was your inspiration behind that what are some of your favorite recipes and let's talk about your roommate tracy and why you guys both started it together so uh when i i going back to when we first started chatting about this, I loved cooking my, my whole life. I've like have a huge passion for cooking. That's like my happy places in the kitchen. And uh, when I was in high school, I started my own catering company called Simply Delicious. So this like dates back way, way, way long time ago. Uh, so I would, I would cater. I was like a high schooler. I cater like local events and I did a wedding and whatever, just like random graduation parties or whatnot. I used to take classes at the Culinary Institute in Connecticut and I used some of those recipes for like my catering events. And then I ended up going to college and got the job at ESPN and ended up on TV and so on and so forth. And, um, my roommate, Tracy, who was my roommate at UMass, she ended up moving 15 minutes away from me here in Florida. And we were like, this is wild. So 
our family, she has two young kids. Uh, her husband became quick best friends with my husband. So we would spend every weekend together and we would just cook like a ton of food. Like, well, we're going to watch a football game. Like, oh, let's make, you know, buffalo chicken dip and blah, blah, blah. And like everything we were making, we were eating, we're like, damn, this is so good. Like we should share these recipes. So we were thinking about it and I was like, well, I used to have this food blog or I, you know, I used to have this catering company. Now Trace's maiden last name was Simon. So S I M simply delicious. So it's both of our maiden names put together. And we kind of, we we're like, let's just share our recipes with the world. So like we're both working moms. We want like good, amazing, quick, easy, simple, delicious recipes. And we want to share it with everyone. They're family friendly. It's probably stuff you have in your pantry, which has been perfect for the pandemic. Um, and we just started, you know, posting and we started our own YouTube channel. And obviously with everything going on with coronavirus, we haven't been able to get together and cook, but like we're still updating our site and we're hoping to grow our little brand. And we just love it. Like we scheduled off Tuesday mornings from nine till noon. We would get together and we would cook and we'd like post and do videos and whatnot. And it was kind of like our little escape from life and nothing like makes us happier than cooking and eating. So that's what we do. And it's been so fun. So some recipes that you should definitely check out. I'd say one of the easiest ones and one of the fan favorites is the honey soy chicken. It literally takes like 15 minutes and you will never get Chinese food takeout ever again. Just saying, you should try it. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds delicious. I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. My boyfriend loves to eat like chicken and rice and usually oh. broccoli or some type of vegetable after a workout. So I'm gonna have to mention that to him. It's so good. And it's like so much healthier than ordering it. Like it's you know what's going into your food. And I'm telling you, it's so simple. Like you gotta give it a try. Amazing. You guys are now listening to Jenny Dell. Again, simply delicious. It's a play on words for both her former roommate Tracy for her last name is, or used to be Simon. And mm -hmm. obviously delicious comes from Dell. You guys can check out their Instagram. They have so many great recipes on there. Please go look at those awesome food recipes. Campus Eats, again, okay. we're just gonna keep rolling on with the food train here. So Campus Eats is a TV show and highlights food spots in the Big Ten college areas. How is it working on that TV show? Where did you get to travel to? What did you get? What did you get to try? Like, what, what was that whole experience like being on a food show, especially being a, a crazy foodie like you are? It's literally a dream job. Like, if you think about what your dream job would be, it's like, oh, I want to travel around and like eat really good food and like hang out with cool people. And it's like, oh, here's Campus Eats. There you go. <laughs> so it's it's crazy the way it came about. The um, So Victory Pictures is the production company that produces Campus Eats. They were kind of like the mastermind behind the whole show. So I, there's... Mike is the head of Victory Pictures. And Mike was my, he was the editor for Monday Night Football when I was a production assistant on Monday Night Football. So my job when I worked on Monday Night Football was to sit in the production truck and we would put together basically these features that would air during the broadcast. So I would sit with this guy, Mike, and we would like be putting footage together, music and clips. And like, he's a creative genius, but we would always talk about food because it's like, that's, you know, who doesn't like to eat. So uh, like seven years after I worked with him, I get a phone call out of the blue and he's like, Hey, Jenny, it's Mike. And I'm like, what? How? Hey, how are you? Like, I haven't talked to you in years. And he's like, question. He's like, do you still like love food? And I was like, yes. And he's like, so I'm pitching this show called Campus Eats. Uh, basically, we're going to highlight some of the best restaurants in Big Ten country. Uh, would you want to host it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, absolutely. So I ended up um, getting paired up with this guy, Troy Johnson, who is a genius and one of my favorite human beings in the entire world. Uh, he probably is most well known. He had a food show on Food Network called Crave for a while. He's one of the top judges for guys grocery games now. He is literally like my brother. Uh, he lives in San Diego, works for San Diego Magazine. Is a, He's just a genius. Um, and he's probably the funniest human being that I've ever been around. And my husband's probably going to get mad at me for saying that. But no, it's Troy. Sorry, Will. Um, and so we travel around. We spend like three months every year traveling around to all the Big Ten schools and eating at all the best restaurants there. And there's a sports tie-in. We talk to former athletes who's, who've gone to the schools and they're like, yes, this is where I would get the best burger. We talk to current coaches and whatnot. And it's literally like we just crush food for three months. And it's the best job in the world. 
<laughs> literally sounds like a dream job. And again, going back to the beginning of our start of our interview, when you said that you wanted to do event marketing, you enjoyed food, you almost went to culinary school. Again, here you are literally getting the opportunity to do everything just <laughs> meshed together in a different way. But you are literally getting to live your dream job in separate ways, of course, but it all kind of just like happened. Again, I truly believe in fate. And let's say on this food train, before we wrap up, guys, Game Day Eats. You guys know that our show is all about Game Day Eats. Obviously, we have a big foodie here. What do you and Will like to eat on Sunday night football, Monday night mm -hmm. football? What do you guys like to cook if you guys are having an at-home date night? So Will is a expert griller and smoker. So I pretty much cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. He's very spoiled. Um, but usually on the weekends, like, so I, right now I'm doing college football. So I will get home either very, very late on Saturday night or early on Sunday morning. So like right now it's like, we'll, we'll throw like, you know, pulled pork on the smoker. I'll always make like a Buffalo chicken dip or something that you could be like snacky with. And then I always have to have something sweet too. Um, we have these, um, Nutella, these chocolate hazelnut bites that are so good and so easy too to make. Uh, we, we like to pick throughout Sunday games, I feel like, instead of having sitting down for like a big meal. So whether we're doing like pulled pork sandwiches, but like snacking along the way, um, you know, homemade pizza, just any, any good like game day food we are down for. Sounds like you guys are absolutely crushing those game day eats and yeah. positive pop. You obviously are a shining bright light, so you must have loads of positive pop in there. What are some of your favorite positive sayings? Or do you have like a mantra? What is your positive pop? I feel like, so I, I try to always be present. Like that's something that I, that's kind of like my mantra, if you will, is like the be where your feet are. I feel like, um, if you can be present in the moment when you're, you know, whether it's on the field during game day or at home with your family, like put your phone down, just like be present in that moment and dedicate 110% to like exactly what you're doing right there. Obviously my family comes first in, in everything, but for those four hours during the game, like I need to be focused on the game. So I feel like be where your feet are and just like stay present and just be gracious for every opportunity that comes your way. Um, I feel like that's kind of what what gets me, you know, positive and motivated and just present. That is some excellent positive pop. I love all of your game day eats and you absolutely crushed this interview. We're about to wrap up the show. It went a little bit longer than I anticipated. I'm oh, like looking at the time, I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh. Um, where can people follow your amazing love story, your sports career? Shout out your social media that way people can continue to follow what you are up to in the future. So you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Jenny Dell. I think they're at Jenny Dell underscore for most of them. Um, someone had at Jenny Dell, but you know, at Jenny Dell underscore, you type it in, you'll see it. And then also the food blog, you can find us at www.simplydelicious.com. It's D-E-L-L-icious.com. We also have our Instagram at Simply Delicious and a Facebook page. Amazing. You were so incredible today. And you guys can obviously follow the Boss Babes. On all forms of social media, please follow Brittany Baldi, your host on all forms of social media. Thank you for listening to us both on Spotify and iTunes and, of course, watching these live streams. Jenny, you are so amazing, and I'm wishing you guys the happiest of upcoming holidays. Thank you so much. Same Thank to you. you.